Today is Palm Sunday, and so it's even more disappointing that we can't be together, that we can't walk up the front walk of the church and see palm fronds decorating the doors or palm fronds taped to the end of our pews or to try to take our individual palm frond we get and fold it into the shape of a cross. We miss those opportunities on a day like today. We've done something different with the palm fronds we ordered this year. Jessica McAdoo collected them and she wrote each person's name in our church on an individual palm frond. And then she laid them out on the front yard of the church, making a highway to our God. That's the photo you saw on the top of your order of worship as you began the service. So, happy Palm Sunday, Trinity Presbyterian Church. That Palm Sunday when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was happy, but there were other energies and emotions going on there as well. And I want to make certain that we have the full picture of what that day was like as we think about Jesus entry into Jerusalem. When Jesus came to the festival, his face was on the most wanted lists of the pictures in the post offices in Jerusalem. Did you know that? The religious leaders had a bounty out on his head, and everyone knew that. So as the festival came, there was a lot of conversation among people saying, what do you think? Is Jesus going to come? It seems kind of risky for him to come. It's been a risky journey of love from the very beginning for Jesus. As he entered this world, he was subject to viruses and accidents just like our children, to famine or even the ravages of war. But he came. Maybe risky journey of love isn't the right term. Maybe it would be better to say certain journey of love because risk implies there's a way to get out of it to avoid the risk of harm. But it was certain from the very beginning that one way or another, Jesus was going to die before this journey was done. Amazingly, Jesus chose this certain journey of love that would lead to death even before he was born in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, excuse me. But as he enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he is now choosing the time and place of his death because that is what it would mean for him to enter Jerusalem that day. Let's remind ourselves this holy week, this week of all weeks, that God has never stood apart from our suffering. God is not indifferent to our distress, but rather the love of the Trinity has gathered itself up and created a plan to rescue us from sin and death. And that plan involves sending the Son, Jesus, into the hot spots of viruses and political intrigue and family rifts and grief of losing loved ones. We might expect that under these circumstances where there's an order that if anyone sees Jesus, they should report him immediately so he could be arrested. We might expect Jesus to slip into Jerusalem through the back door under the cover of night and then be secreted away to a home that had no association with him so that no one could find him. Instead, we see Jesus going to a house where everyone knew he frequented. And we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem through the front day in broad daylight. So courageous, so committed, so loving is our Jesus. Let's remember his courage and be encouraged by that in these uncertain times that Jesus enters them with us now as well. What captures my attention in these two stories we read are 
the acts of worship we see demonstrated there. Because this is the first time, it might be the only time in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is actually worshipped, adored for who he appears to be, for all he appears to be. Jesus has been letting his secret out for months now. Everywhere he goes, he drops hints that he is actually the Son of God, that he's actually God with us. But we've known all along that it's been hard for the people who heard Jesus to make sense of that, to grasp that possibility. We've stood in the shoes of the woman at the well. We looked at Jesus through the eyes of Nicodemus. And we've discovered just how hard it is to imagine that the person in flesh and bone standing in front of us might somehow be the God who governs the universe. It's been a challenge for Jesus to get people there. But as Jesus is crossing the finish line of his ministry, he performed the most remarkable miracle of all, raising Lazarus from the dead. And that became the proof that people needed to realize that Jesus is somehow intimately connected with God. And so they worship him. They begin to give him the adoration that he is due. It's imperfect worship, just like ours. But it is perhaps what Jesus has wanted most his entire life, to be seen, to be recognized, to be appreciated as the gracious activity of God in this world. I'm going to focus on the crowds first. They'd come to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. This is the highest holy day of the year. Jerusalem would normally have about 25,000 residents, but during Passover, it would swell to 125,000 residents because of all the pilgrims who come for the festival. Pilgrims, they came expectant. They came expectant of meeting God. They came expectant of encountering God in the temple, which was the grandest, most holy building in all of Israel. To go inside the temple was to be overwhelmed with a sense of awe and holy wonder and worshipful expectation that God might show up. Pilgrims came expectant. When Cynthia and I were traveling this summer on sabbatical, we spent a week in Rome. And one of the things we wanted to do was to visit the Vatican. Unfortunately, we had not reserved tickets before we got there, and we found that it was going to be hard to get tickets to the Vatican unless we upgraded to a more expensive package like having breakfast at the Vatican and getting early entrance into the Sistine Chapel. You know, that chapel that has that magnificent painting on the ceiling of God creating Adam. Well, we bit the bullet, bought the breakfast package. I wrote it in my calendar as breakfast with the Pope. We went, and it was worth it. To get into the Sistine Chapel early with just 50 of us, as opposed to the five or 600 that are normally squeezed into that space. And we were able to savor every painting on the ceiling and every panel on the walls. And it was overwhelming. It filled us with wonder. The great crowds, as John calls them, they were expectant. This was the Passover. They were there. They were at the temple. Surely God might do something. God might meet them at this Passover as a pilgrim. Worship begins with our expectancy. When we get ourselves dressed, we get out of bed, we drive to church, or we sit down in front of our tablet or computer like we're doing now, we come with a sense of expectancy a hope that God will encounter us. 
A hope that God will cut through the fog of all the activities and the emotions and the experiences of the week, and that God might somehow make himself known unmistakably as we gather for worship, that God might somehow encourage our faith, that God might somehow strengthen our belief that all of this is actually real after all, that we might somehow be empowered to go on with the rest of the week because we met God in worship. Well, praise God, that happens all the time when we come to worship. We find ourselves encountering God in the lyrics of a song that we sing or we hear, or we find the words of Scripture landing in our hearts like fertile soil, and we feel it taking root and bringing life. Or maybe the words of the sermon suggest that the pastor was once again going through our mail. These are all ways in which our worship is expectant when God meets us. When these expectant pilgrims got to Jerusalem, they heard about a rabbi who was unlike any other rabbi. This particular rabbi spoke in ways that filled people with hope rather than burdened them with guilt. This particular rabbi hung out with ordinary people rather than hanging out with the elite. And this rabbi performed the most amazing signs that no one has ever seen before, like restoring the sight of a man who'd been blind since his birth. And just a couple of weeks earlier, this rabbi had reportedly raised someone from the dead. And there were eyewitnesses all over Jerusalem only too eager to tell us what they saw. Surely this rabbi must someone be someone connected with God because how else could he do these amazing things if God wasn't behind it? Maybe he was their long-awaited Messiah. Maybe he's the one that God is sending to redeem Israel and to begin his eternal reign forever right here and right now. It was this expectation that God was going to do something in this moment that drew the crowds outside of Jerusalem in order to greet Jesus and to create an impromptu parade as they brought their possible Messiah into the city, into the temple during this holy season of Passover. They were expectant. What might God do? No one knew for certain, but they were certain it would be something good. I found myself wondering, what was this like for Jesus to have these people welcoming him, praising him, celebrating him? I'm pretty certain it didn't go to his head like it would ours. But I wonder if it went to his heart if his heart was warmed, that he was finally recognized and worshipped for who he truly was. It was an imperfect worship, just like ours, but it was a start. And it was a welcome that expected more, that had to warm Jesus' heart. It had to stir the heart of his father to see people worshipping his son with expectation and hope. Did this worship encourage Jesus? Did it sustain him during the last week of his life? Does our worship feed the heart of Jesus as he continues to walk in this world with us through the challenges that we experience and face? Expectancy of worship isn't everything, but it is a start. Some of those people in the crowd who sang Jesus into into Jerusalem will five days later start shouting for his crucifixion. But being expectant of encountering God in worship can get us started on the journey with God and lead us deeper into the heart of worship, as it did for Mary 
and Martha and Lazarus. Before Jesus was worshipped by the crowds, he was worshipped by a grateful family. We met this family last week when Mary and Martha sent an urgent message to Jesus that their brother, whom Jesus loved, was ill. And you remember how that story ended? It ended with resurrection. Jesus bringing Lazarus back from the dead. So this family decided to have a banquet, a party for Jesus. And throwing this party was an act of worship. Each of them doing what they did best. Martha worshipped through serving. She created a bountiful meal because nothing says love like a homemade meal placed in front of you. Martha worshipped by serving. Lazarus worshipped by beaming. I mean, this man who had tasted death was now drinking deeply of life, grateful to be alive, and his act of worship was just to be there and to radiate the joy that he is still here because of Jesus. But it's Mary's acts of worship that are most celebrated in the story. Mary's worship was generous. She was looking for a way to express her affection for Jesus. And whatever way it was, it had to be significant to show just how much she loved Jesus. So she brought what she had. It happened to be a pound of perfume, a pound of pure nard. I don't know what that was, but apparently it was the really good stuff because it was worth $35,000 in today's economy. In her act of worship, Mary took the jar and opened it and poured it out on Jesus' feet, all of it. We're told that the fragrance filled the house, probably filled the whole block with the fragrance of that perfume. And then she took her hair and she wiped the excess perfume off of Jesus' feet so that both Jesus and she would be carrying that fragrance with them in the days ahead. When we come truly expectant of meeting God in worship and we want to express our worship, it's good for us to look for something we can give that's generous, that is significant in order to show Jesus and the Father and the Spirit just how much we love them. I think the most generous thing we can give in worship is our attention our focus, our full attention on God. It seems to me that every time we come to worship, we have to climb over the obstacle of distraction. Whenever we sit still for a few minutes, our minds wander in lots of different directions. And if we're in worship, following those rabbit trails of thought, pretty soon we'll just be enduring the moments of worship. Can't wait till it gets over so we can get up and get busy about the things we've been thinking about while we're worshiping. How glad would it make the heart of God if we brought our full attention to worship? What more could we give God than our entire focus on Him Worshipping, noticing, celebrating, praising who he is. What more could God want than that all of us that comes with our full attention? Jesus was pleased by this extravagant, generous, radical expression of worship. He interpreted what Mary did as her preparing him for his burial, which is not something she could have imagined or anticipated, but it's how Jesus experienced her gift of worship. He took it in as ministering to his heart and even his body. We discover that our expectant and generous worship actually ministers to the heart of God. It ministers to Jesus. 
giving them something that matters helps God to feel honored and cared for. Every time we gather for worship and we come expectant, giving of ourselves and our full attention, giving generously, we minister to the heart of God. And it makes God's heart very glad. Amen.